I'm Sam Katz with History Making Productions. Welcome to this webisode, a tour of yellow fever sites in Philadelphia. You'll see some places you've been to and some you've never been to, all of which have a deep connection in helping to tell the story of the epidemic of 1793 that nearly wiped out the city. Thanks for joining us. We hope you learned something new about Philadelphia. In the 1790s, in addition to being the capital of the United States, Philadelphia was one of the most active and important ports in North America. Sugar and rum and other spices came into the port of Philadelphia. But a slave rebellion changed the nature of that cargo in the summer of 1793 when French citizens and their slaves, fleeing the chaos, came to Philadelphia in merchant ships like those owned by Stephen Girard. Hidden in that cargo were mosquitoes, some of which were carrying a deadly fever that would change life in Philadelphia in ways that few could imagine. We're standing in the shadow of the Benjamin Franklin Bridge the homes that would have been here would not have been the most desirable in the city. One of them was a rooming house that then housed two young sailors. And at the end of July, within a 12-hour period, both of them were dead from symptoms that were quite frightening. We're standing here at Front and Dock Street. Dock Street, which runs along the Society Hill Towers, was a creek that runs right up past the Mercantile Exchange. I'm coming out of Dock Creek, a basin just above 3rd Street. This area, this basin was surrounded by tanneries who would skin animals and throw the carcasses into the creek, which was subject to tidal action. So what swept out in the morning came back in the evening. And for a lot of people, they believe this was the source of that yellow fever. In the shadow of the State House, or Independence Hall, the American Philosophical Society was created in order to house all kinds of archival material from the early republic. But it also was the place of meeting for the College of Physicians. Let's go in and take a look. It was right here where Benjamin Rush and William Curry fought viciously over the causes and cures of yellow fever. Dr. Benjamin Rush was Philadelphia's leading physician. Of course, we know today that the therapies that Dr. Rush administered to yellow fever patients probably accelerated the death rate in that terrible summer of 1793. But Rush was a signer of the Declaration of Independence. He was a leader and co-founder of the College of Physicians. And of course, he was a great Philadelphian. Benjamin Rush and his wife, Julia Stockton Rush, are buried right here at the Christ Church burial grounds at Fifth and Arch Street in a cemetery that houses many luminaries from that period. On the other side of the burial ground is the tombstone of Mayor Matthew Clarkson. You'll remember from our show that Matthew Clarkson was the only power left in Philadelphia when President Washington and Governor Mifflin left with their legislatures and Congress. And Clarkson, who didn't have any real power, realized that it was on him to try to organize some kind of effort to calm the panic and take civic action against this disease. I have, of course, a special place in my heart for mayors. And it seems to me that during this period, Mayor Matthew Clarkson was one of the heroes. Matthew Clarkson died in 1800 from yellow fever. We're at Mother Bethel Church at the corner of 6th and Lombard, founded by Richard Allen. And we're here with Reverend Mark Kelly Tyler, the pastor of Mother Bethel. Yeah, well, um, Richard Allen, as you know, played a major role in yellow fever. And what's interesting to note is that when yellow fever broke out, we already owned this piece of land that we're standing on. He purchased it in 1791, and uh, yellow fever really interrupted his church building activities. Uh, he put all of his personal work aside and instead dedicated himself 
to helping in that major crisis. Also, this is a church which houses a museum. Both Sarah Bass and Richard Allen rest. Yes, that's in, correct. In the church's museum. Right, so they're buried in the museum and uh, we get visitors from all around the world who come to pay their respects to them daily. Thank you, Reverend. Yeah. We're at the corner of Christian and Front on the property of Old Swedes, Gloria Day Church, the oldest church in Philadelphia and the second oldest church in America. Gloria Day Church was home of Pastor Nicholas Collin, and Pastor Collin was out here a lot, burying his parishioners, victims of yellow fever. We're at the heart of Independence Historical National Park, at a site where President George Washington and his wife Martha and Washington slaves lived while Philadelphia was the national capital. Washington came out of his front door every morning to a bustling Market Street, or High Street, as it was known back then, and would encounter Philadelphians of every walk of life. Of course, that contact ended in the summer of 1793, when together with Martha, he hightailed it up to Germantown in order to get away from low-lying land of Philadelphia close to the water where yellow fever was so prevalent. We're standing just above what is today Northern Liberties in what would have been the heart of the Liberty section back in 1790. This is Germantown Road. This road was crowded with carriages and coaches of Philadelphians fleeing to higher ground we're standing on Spring Garden Street between 16th and 17th, across the street from the Community College of Philadelphia in a section of the city that had been sold to the Hamilton family, which built a huge estate known as Bush Hill. In 1793, Mayor Matthew Clarkson, illegally, I might add, took control of Bush Hill while the Hamilton family was away in England. Clarkson organized the committee and asked Stephen Gerard and Peter Helm, who was a coppersmith, to come in here and reorganize Bush Hill, which they did. Bush Hill eventually became a very strong performer in the effort to try to reduce the exposure to yellow fever. After another outbreak of yellow fever, the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania created the Board of Public Health and empowered the city to take action to prevent the recurrence of that deadly epidemic. We're standing at the Lazaretto, a quarantine hospital constructed in Tinicum Township in 1799. Out on the riverfront, ships that came up had to go through inspection to determine whether their cargoes were infected or their passengers. And if their passengers were infected, they came into rooms like this, where they were quarantined until healthy and returned to go back up to the city. This lazaretto was a critical line of defense in Philadelphia's ongoing efforts to keep epidemics out of the city. In 1799, Philadelphia had experienced the last in a series of major yellow fever epidemics. Something had to be done. A committee of city council called the Watering Committee came up with an idea of a central water system that would serve the entire city. We're standing in the courtyard of City Hall, what on Penn's plan was known as Center Square. And in 1801, the Watering Committee commissioned Benjamin Latrobe one of the nation's boldest and most innovative engineers to design and construct a steam-driven water system right here in the center of the city. Until about 1811, that water system served all of Philadelphia, most of whose residents lived between here and the Delaware River. The center square waterworks were simply not adequate to serve this growing population. So the Watering Committee commissioned a new steam-powered waterworks 
uh, that would lift water from the Schuylkill River up to a reservoir built on Fairmount. The Fairmount Waterworks isn't just a bunch of pumps, and pipes. This architectural and visual pleasure ultimately gave way to the development of a new art museum in 1928. And so, where the reservoir once stood, now stands the Philadelphia Museum of Art. And the park surrounding the museum and originally surrounding the waterworks became known as Fairmount Park. The story of yellow fever in 1793 and the subsequent epidemics that attacked Philadelphia is a story of devastation and destruction and of course death. But it's also a story of inspiration and courage. People like Ann Parrish, Sarah Bass, Matthew Clarkson, Richard Allen, Stephen Girard. These are the people whose courage and grit and determination embodied what we know today as a Philadelphian. It's a story of a city that summoned the courage and summoned the vision to build a waterworks, to create a public health system, to build a lazaretto, and yet to also create a place that could be livable. To learn more about yellow fever, how it devastated the city and how the city responded, and to find out more about the history of Philadelphia, visit us at historyofphilly.com. And thanks for joining us today.